Welcome to The Merge, stories of people bridging their faith in Christ with their calling to serve in our culture, with your host, Chris Autry. Welcome to The Merge Podcast. We want to highlight people in our region who merge their faith in Christ with their leadership in our community. This month, we will spend some time hearing from local heroes, first responders who live out their faith in Christ as they labor so hard to preserve life. Today, we welcome back our good friend, Lindy Horn from Narragate Counseling, who will help us think through and minister to others who have been through a traumatic experience. Uh, Lindy, how are the girls doing? They are doing well. Gosh, doing I love well. them so much, man. Me too. They're so fantastic. <laughs> Um, what, what do you love about summertime? What do you and your family love about summertime? Um, so I thought about this for a minute because it's, it's changed a little bit for me, but the one thing that I I absolutely love about summer is the longer days. Like I love that I can still be, we can be out in the backyard and still be playing or doing something and it's eight 30 at night and the sun is still there. Like it just feels like these good days are going. So I really love that. Now the older I get. I don't like that kind of like used to be my favorite season. I don't think that I I think it's like at the bottom now because I also feel the heat and the annoyance of other things. But if I'm focusing on the positive parts of summer, like it's the long days and just I, I love that. Your girls, I, I, they seem like they're always up for the adventure. Like, I think you could <laughs> say are. to them, listen, 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 ladies, we're going to. We're going to go wrestle an alligator. They, they might ask a question or two, but they're going to be like, let's do it. Let's do it. We're, Especially we're my four-year-old. Yeah, yeah, for real. I am, oh, man. She's the best. She's, she's the best. Like, she is the best. Like, okay. Yeah. We, we're going to wrestle. How are we going to do it? We're going to feed them something first, right? We're going to, okay, let's do it. I'm game. Let's go. Right, is, that, is that them? They Completely. Like, and I don't, you know, I have an adventure spirit myself. Like, I've, mm-hmm. I, I just, I've always seen life in that way um and i think chris and i really approach it that way too like let's i mean we make little things in adventure like if we're going out to just eat at me casita like we make it some type of like in some way we're going to get into an adventure like whatever yeah. that and so they get excited about the little things too which is awesome so yeah hey, chris and i in in uh and Bruce Jackson were meeting several months ago at Chick Fil A, and Chris brought the girls with him, and and uh, and I, I didn't know the girls were coming, but the girl the girls came, and I was sitting across from them, and I said, "Listen, I'm buying your I'm buying Chick Fil A, and when we're done, if you could just hang with us for a little bit, I'm I'm gonna buy you a milkshake or ice cream, whichever one you want. I'll, it's, I'm buying it for you." And they were the best. They, I mean, I was just I didn't listen to one thing Bruce and Chris were talking about. I was just watching them like. How are you? Like I'm fidgeting over here, struggling to pay They're attention, so good. and you're just like chilling out, eating my chicken nuggets. You know, we're gonna get ice cream in a minute. Yeah, we get ice cream in a minute. You know, they were the best. And then, and Bruce noticed it too. And so Bruce taps me and goes, "Let me go buy these girls a milkshake." I like. I feel like we should. So I told him, like, listen. Anytime y'all come to a meeting, just know Bruce and I, we got you. We're milkshakes and Chick Fil A is on us. Okay, we got you. Y'all are the best. You know, I don't even act like them as an adult. Like they are fantastic. They really are. All right, what's the one thing you and the girls y'all have to do? You, Chris, and the girls y'all have to do this in the summertime. What's the one thing has to happen in the summer? I, you know, I really was thinking about that, and I don't, I don't have anything that they have to do, and I really think it's because partly we homeschool, right? So they don't really know the difference yet at four and seven oh, yeah, of yeah, the yeah. summer versus not. So we don't really have like. It's not a thing like that, but what I will say is my girls from the get-go are, I I always call them water babies. They love the water, like Uh pool, lake, ocean, water table in the backyard with the hose. Like they want to be in the water and they know that summertime when it's hot means that they get to go to the water. I mean, Liberty, as soon as it gets a little warm, like in April, mom, is the pool open yet? Yeah. Oh yeah. You know what I'm like? Not yet, babe. Not yet. It'll be after your birthday before the pool's (laughs) open. You know, we can't go yet. Um, So they're, they very much, they love water. So I think that's one thing they enjoy about summer is just, I mean, just playing. Like I said, it could even be the water hose. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. They just want to be. They want to be in the water. I am so with them. Yeah. Summertime, put me in the water. I want to be in the water all the time. But I'm, I'm absolutely with them. For my family, we go to the beach and we play this one version of Monopoly every year, just the three of us, and it lasts two days of our entire. <laughs> be- no wow. kidding. 
and we break some rules. Like I, I, I will give like a max amount of every kind of, you know, denomination of currency and we all pick our little figurine and whoever wins, it is bragging rights for the year. I mean, and I'm telling you it like we, we only play it once as a family and it, and it's it's the one that they did years ago where they kind of americanized it where um they they changed the traditional board and it became all these american landmarks so um, i think that's the version i have yeah like the like the liberty bells on there and yes. all that, that one yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. and like it's and you the have money like french fire. fries and yeah. it, like all that mm-hmm. oh we love it i think starbucks is on there a little yes. coffee cup. yes that's it that's ours that's the one we have we and it we go to town and like even becca <laughs> even like who like do that's you not have the same do you have to do the same player or is it every year you purposefully pick a different one i think so sam and i traditionally will fight over the camaro i think and usually I'll concede and I'll, I'll take the Starbucks cup. And Becca, she usually picks the same one. But I, mean, I can't remember which one it is, though. I have to see it. Is it the – I can't remember which one. Yes, Becca does. Sam and I, we fight over <laughs> We we That's what we do. But um, tell me a good book you're reading. Good book, especially one that makes you think. So this is going to sound so funny, but I'm just being serious. Um, I Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Like, I don't have any other books right now that I'm reading. Yeah. Um, I've been really intentional. I've been using, a lot of people have, um, in some circles that I'm in, the Bible recap mm-hmm. with Terry Lee Cobalt. So I've really been intentionally reading chronologically through the Bible this year with her plan. And to be honest, I'm so focused on that, doing that and really wanting to do it that I haven't really picked up, I haven't picked up a new book. Yeah. I really haven't. Like, I'm really focused on the plan. And right now I'm in Isaiah. Good. And Isaiah is a beast. It is. It definitely, I'm in the, I like I'm in the 30s too. Like, I still have a wife. I'm oh. like, uh, I'm right there in the middle. When you get so. to Isaiah 46, it, 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 that and Isaiah 53 are my favorite <clears throat> chapters of, of Isaiah. Hands down. Matter of fact, I just read Isaiah 46 last week. And I was telling Becca, when, he, when, he, um, when the Lord tells Isaiah... He's like, listen, the nation has taken their blacksmith and they've made their gods and they've thrown them over their chest and they've put them on mantles. And what do they do? Nothing. Like, that's literally what he says. They do nothing. But I'm the one who controls the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I I love those texts when God kind of flexes muscle. That's just me. But uh, I'm reading, I just read Putting an X Through Anxiety by Louis Giglio, and it was so good. And that's why I read Isaiah 46, because it's he goes through it in there. Wow. Uh, that sounds like a great book. So good. And he writes short books, so you go through them really quickly. And so, um, but he he gives you biblical foundations for walking through anxiety. I love that. So, all right, last time you were here, you talked about a word for the year. Hmm. What's your word, and how is that working out? So my What's word for you? the year... It's been practice. So just practically speaking, taking like the theories or the things that you know, the the knowledge that you have learned or come across and applying it. So I have found myself doing that in a lot of different ways. Like one of those is um, like practically taking some of the things that I would usually individually do one on one in a counseling session, Mm -hmm. like taking that and applying it to groups or audiences or different things like that. So that's been one thing. And another one is God has really been challenging me in my own walk to communicate differently Mm -hmm. in certain areas. And so I've really been practicing those things. So it's like, it's been great. It's been a great word. And I'm, I'm seeing how it's playing out personally, professionally, in a, in a lot of different ways, so all right, I like it. Walk me through this a little bit because <laughs> I've ha- I've had that conversation with a lot of people lately. So you're taking something that you've learned and you're putting into practice, but you're getting kind of nitty and gritty with it, right? Absolutely. Okay, so what does that look like? Give me something that hmm. you've been practicing for, a, or you've known a long time, and you're now <clears throat> practicing it. How are you fleshing that out? Um. Hmm, put me on the spot. Let me see what comes up here. I know, I did throw you the left hook. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. Um, Like, one is even communicating differently in my marriage. Mm. I mean, 
we've been married 17 years, right? You can get into certain patterns or lulls or some work great, some are unintentional, whatever that is. Even showing up and practicing the way I would communicate a concern. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's showing up in parenting. I'm trying to think of something specific, but I, um, I'm really trying to uh, – like take some of the theories I've even learned um, from like a human development standpoint and applying it to my own parenting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that place of developing critical thinking skills for your children. So you don't do in, in the name of servanthood of being a mom, I don't serve them so much that I serve them out of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. So putting the practice of myself of being like, stop. They can go figure that out. Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so hard. Um, so hard. So, I mean, just even practical. I think a, a lot of parents just walk walk that walk anyways. But I, that's just a practical one of because mine are really to a point where they're gaining independence in certain areas. And I've seen where in my mom momming, in my serving as a mom, that it's time for me to back up. Mm-hmm. so that they gain more independence in the right way instead of me just... Because it's so easy as an adult to just do something for a mm-hmm. child. It's so easy. Um, less messy sometimes, yeah. takes less time to do it, and it's just like, no. Like, you need to practice Yep. letting them grow Yeah. and doing that for themselves, and you need to practice stopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, it, it's gone in a lot of different. It's gone in a lot of different ways. We're talking about trauma. Yeah. This month, and so I've had some first responders on, and they have been so good. They've given us such rich tools on how to process and handle trauma. How do you define trauma? So, I'm gonna kind of go to my to the counseling psychology field here with this one um in a minute but i mean really the word trauma literally means a wound shock or an injury Mm. i mean wound shock or injury so and in general that word um the roots of it are are physical but we know at this point because we're not just a physical body Mm. um we're an emotional body we're a spiritual body that that can go in any place so to me and to the psychological association, it's more of a wound, an injury, or a shock caused by some event that you've experienced as life threatening or deeply stressful in some way. Um, it, and it continues to make a long lasting impact for you. So, a lot of times on my field, they talk about big T's and little T's, big traumas and little traumas, mm-hmm. right? And I don't even know if it's about that as much as trauma looks different for different people. But but it's a wound and injury of some sort, a shock to your conscience, a wound and injury that an event that has happened, or it could be ongoing events, that you experience as deeply stressful or threatening, um, and, and, it, and it has a negative impact on your life. And when you mean impact, you're talking... Not just a, a momentary impact, right? Right. You're talking about something that's that's long term. Mm-hmm. Yeah, long lasting effects. So okay. if we do that from a small standpoint, right? Let's say that um, you're in a car wreck. Let's say it was a minor, um, but then for the next couple of months, you are nervous every time you get in a car or you wonder if that car is going to stop and you kind of have some jerky reactions. Mm -hmm. Um, But let's say after two or three months of being back on the road and being safe, that goes away like that, that would, that, that would be considered a little trauma, right? I mean, there was some, there was some fear there. Mm -hmm. There was some, my brain saying, Oh, I'm not safe. But after a few months, like that really does, you kind of go back to normal life. Yeah. So that would be one of those where we're resilient, we're kind of moving on. That's not really in my field what we're talking about. That's a that's a momentary trauma or a little T maybe, but but the longer lasting impact of something. So um, let's talk a little bit about those effects. You said fear yeah, is something that can come from trauma. What what are some other effects that trauma, a traumatic moment, can leave on the brain or the soul? Yeah. Um well In the brain in general, it's going to rewire it to a certain level. And again, it depends on the impact of the trauma, 
the time that it happens in your life, how long it happens. So all of that's a variable, but it's going to rewire your brain in some way. And it's going to rewire it in a way that you prioritize safety differently than you did before. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not necessarily a negative thing. Um, It can be when we get stuck there and that's all the brain prioritizes, right? Is safety over everything else. Um, then it can start cutting out health, other things that may be healthy in our lives. But um, so it really pays attention. The brain at that point is rewired to be like, oh, it, it makes it what I call threat sensitive. Mm-hmm. So it may not have been sensitive to that threat before. And then after you have a traumatic experience, then your brain is like, I'm going to be threat sensitive now, mm-hmm. not just to that, but to everything. Um, so so there's a rewiring there, which can be worked on and I mean, the brain, the brain is neuroplastic, which means it can change. So the good news is, is we can work with that rewiring right. um, to a healthy place. I would say when you get down to the like soul and purpose and existential things, it really challenges and changes what you have known and believe about the world. Mm. And, and so it's this place of... It, it changes a perspective on what you thought you knew about the world, what you think you know about the world. Like it, you, it changes the glasses that you look through things with. It just does from that like soul perspective and spiritually, I think it can, it can do that as well. But in the spiritual world, what I've seen a lot, especially with the people that I work with is this place of that's where the enemy really tries to plant seeds that of, of lies in that spiritual world of, um, God didn't really see me or God didn't really care or I'm going to feel this way forever. Or I mean, and there's so many different places, I think, spiritually where the enemy attacks people who have been through trauma because it's a vulnerable area mm-hmm. and he sees the opportunity. So I think that's one place where if that's not a place where you experienced warfare, it may be a place where you more than likely yeah. It's going to be a place where you experience that now because he's trying to plant. I mean, he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy, right? Right. To steal your peace, to kill your identity, and destroy your purpose. I yeah. mean, he's trying to do those things. Yeah. So I see in people who have walked through trauma um, those places where the enemy is just trying to attack. Before we go into a break, what are unhealthy ways someone processes trauma or manages trauma? And I, and, I, and I use the word manage strategically because mm-hmm. that's really what we do. We're just managing. Yeah. So I think from the how, how do people unhealthily process trauma, I, I think for that specifically, I would say not processing it is the unhealthy part. Mm. Um, so when we try to distract, and I think that gets into managing, what is your point? I, I think when we get into running from and not processing it, Um, within a reasonable time. I'm not saying something you go through something and you have to process it immediately. Sometimes you do, depending on the circumstance. Um, But when we refuse to process it, when that opportunity is there, then a lot of times we're going to run from it and try to fill that with distraction, with something to numb, like whatever it ends up being is usually unhealthy or we're using it in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say to process is healthy. Now, there are certain places to do that in safety. Mm. Um, but I would say the unhealthiest thing is to not process it. Years ago, I was serving in South Carolina and um, a church in South Carolina, and I had a lady in our church whose son uh, had a just a, just like a horrific car accident. He was in his early mid-20s, and I'm, I won't tell you how it happened, but like it was like a movie scene mm. kind of th- situation. And uh, she was one of our kind of homebound ladies. And when I got there, she was really young. I mean, like in her 50s. And I didn't understand why she was homebound. And I walked in her living room. And we talked, you know, and we're chit-chatting and stuff. And she immediately points to me to this table that was full of pictures of her son and all these little trinkets of her son. And it was a, a huge, almost like a buffet table you'd put in like a dining room, really nice dining room, okay. just covered in stuff. And, um, and then she just began to unpack to me his death in all the details. And the way she described it, and when, I, when you look at the pictures and you see the table stuff, it, it, to her, it was like it happened 
you know, a week ago. It had happened like 30 years ago. Wow. And in literally like 30 years ago, and I, and I grieved, and I don't mean this to be cold, but I grieved for her because she was never able to move from it. Yeah. You know, she told me how she's, she was on the scene and how she saw him and, <clears throat> You know, and like the like every detail, like she carried for thirty years, she could sure. never move past the loss of her son. Now, I don't, I, again, I don't say it'd be cold, but but that's when I think of like a traumatic experience. Somebody's kind of indirectly experiencing something traumatic, and by indirectly, I mean she was not in the car accident, and and, and somebody's dealing with it in an unhealthy way. Like you said, they're not dealing with it at all. So, so what we want to do is we want to come back from a break. Okay. And I want you to help us think about how do we process and overcome trauma from a biblical following Jesus perspective. Absolutely. So you're listening to the Merge Podcast. We'll be back in just a moment. Thanks for listening to the Merch Podcast. Uh, we have Lindy Horn with Narragate Counseling Center back with us. This month we've been talking about trauma. And you've heard from two wonderful first responders uh, who follow Jesus, and they are, uh, they've are they taught us how to process trauma. And we brought Lindy in to help us think through this biblically, to really flesh out what uh, Leslie and Ricky had gave to us, um, flesh out how they let me say it again, how they've worked through their, they worked through trauma with their faith in Jesus. And Lindy's here to kind of give us some more steps. And so, uh, Lindy, how would you use, let's just say scripture, prayer, and praise to process and overcome trauma? <clears throat> so I want to start with really talking about where in scripture we can find trauma. Because if you haven't looked at the Bible through that lens, um, you can be very surprised at everywhere that that shows up mm -hmm. because the Bible does not sugarcoat trauma mm -mm. Um, at all. And so I'm just going to list a few of the stories of what of different types of trauma that happen in the Bible because I want people to be able to really connect with where they may be where a family member may be where a loved one may be like j because there's so much there so i'm going to start with that <clears throat> i'm just going to kind of read through these a little bit and talk through them so the first one is the cross mm. right like the ultimate physical emotional mental trauma for jesus to go through the cruc crucifixion what his body went through what his emotions went through, how he felt that disconnect relationally from his father, like that abandonment. I mean, so much in there that we can go through. And, and you know, I was really thinking about when I was um, preparing for today, this place of, you know, a lot of times the way God made us, we can't fully experience trauma all at once like he mm. didn't make our bodies to do that mm. because it would overwhelm us like all of our systems would just completely shut down yeah but jesus did yeah on that moment in the cross like not only did he bear our sins because he was perfect but he literally experienced all of it in that one moment so even when we're looking at this from a standpoint of trauma and anything that we've walked through or that we've been through, like he has experienced the ultimate fullness of that in a way that God didn't create our bodies to even be able to do that. Yeah. So just standing there yeah. is a powerful place. So yeah. we, we can start there. But let's also think about the story of David, right? I mean, he ran from Saul because Saul was jealous and was trying to kill him at one point. He was homeless. He was living in caves and other, other places. So that's a trauma. I'm not being able to be with his family. Then after he becomes king and you think things are okay, then he's got a son who tries to murder him, right? And so he's running from his kingdom all over again. So you've got David and he writes some beautiful, beautiful Psalms about God being our good shepherd and walking through the valley of the shadow of death and all of these things. God wounds... Um, he heals our wounds and binds up the broken heart. He's close to the broken hearted. Like David can write all of those Psalms because 
he's been through trauma. Yeah. Like he's experienced those things and he's also experienced the goodness of God in that. Then you have Job. <laughs> right? Yeah. Everything I mean, every loss that he could have as a human, mm-hmm. he experienced. Health, family, fortune, like all of it. Livestock, everything. His means of living, he lost everything. Um, so you've got Job going through that. You've got Joseph who was sold into slavery by his family. Mm. So you've got physical trauma there with Mm -hmm. everything that would have happened in emotional trauma with slavery Mm -hmm. on top of relational trauma because it was his own family that did it. I really look at this one a lot for when we are looking at human trafficking survivors and a lot of times how that all ended up playing out. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very relevant story there a lot of times um, with that. So we've got Joseph. We've got the woman with the issue of blood. Mm. We know for 12 years, this is something, a medical thing that she struggled with. And in that time, she was ostracized, right? She was unclean. Mm. She couldn't practice. She she couldn't go to the temple, Yeah. right? So you've got the the societal um, rejection everywhere there. Um, All the practices she had to go through from that. It says that, like she went to all of these doctors. So in that place, you've got medical trauma. She suffered at the hands of, and, and who knows if what they were trying to do there or not. I'm, I'm not saying anything about that medical, what she sought, but, but there's medical trauma there mm. because of going through and, and it didn't cure the issue, right? So whatever she went through at the hands of, of seeking that, it also says that it drained her of her finances. Yeah. So she's got, you know, how am I going to continue to make a living with this issue and I'm unclean and society's rejected me and, I, and I'm suffering in this way? I mean, there's so much there in yeah. just that woman with the issue of blood. And then you've got Hannah, um, who was very much loved by her husband, but wanted children desperately and didn't have any. And then her husband's other wife... Um, which I don't know how to pronounce her name exactly, but it's Penina or Penina or I always call something. her Penin. Now, Help now, me with now that. Now I'm messing it up. Now I'm mess- Help me. Yeah. Help me, Pastor. how I've always Penina. It. Yeah. I lost it for a second. There we go. It says that every year, so again, a trauma that happened yearly, mm-hmm. right? So you've got the fact of desperately wanting a child. So there's that. I know people know what that trauma feels like. <clears throat> and then on top of that, she has got a bully that every year is taunting her every time they go and and do their things before the Lord in the temple, telling her how she's not been blessed in that way mm-hmm. and making fun of her and bullying her. Every It says every year, year to year, that yeah. that's what happens. So you've got someone who's being bullied. You've got someone dealing with the pain of not having a child in that place, and which, is a tra- which is a trauma. So, I mean, again, we're, they're so... Many and yeah. and then so and this is just a few. We could spend so mm-hmm. long on this. I mean, the last one that I'll end on is the Good Samaritan. Yeah. So you've got a man oh who's gosh, who's that. robbed, right? Yeah. Let, left for dead. So you've got the physical problems going on there, and then you have people walking by that that see you and don't do anything, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a different level of trauma that you experience. And then you have the Good Samaritan, Mm -hmm. which I really like to believe. I mean, we could look at Jesus in that way. We can look at the Holy Spirit in that way that binds and cleans the wounds, Mm -hmm. that provides the way for healing to happen, which in that story, other people are involved, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Good Samaritan didn't heal the man. He paid for his, he paid for the way for him to be healed, but it was actually the innkeeper that he turned him over to, to say, hey, you know, bring this man back to health and yeah. then I'll come back through and whatever's left, like I'll take care of. <clears throat> but we could even look at that as a picture of our walk through trauma with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's so full. Yeah. It's so rich. With, and so when we can look at it in that lens, depending on what we're going through in some way, there is a story in the Bible that parallels what you're going through yep. in some form or fashion that you can talking about how to use scripture and biblical healing, like that you can read, 
that you can meditate on, that you can ask the Holy Spirit to reveal a truth to you. A lot of times in those scriptures, it talks about how they were restored, Mm -hmm. like how the Good Samaritan was restored, how Joseph was restored to his brothers and his family, and how God used that trauma to bring healing to him and his brothers, but also to set up his family from a famine to save them in a completely different way. Like you see the restoration process through this too. Yeah. And you can say like, God, what is, how does that apply to me in, in the present? What yeah. is that going to look like for me in the present? So <clears throat> that that's one way. So, so when I'm saying like, how do we use prayer? First of all, let's just acknowledge or scripture. Let's just acknowledge that it's in there. Yeah. Like it's in the Bible. Yeah, that's right. The Bible covers it all. <laughs> it's about it's about finding it. And like I said, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat it, but it also shows you the impact of trauma and suffering and it provides hope. Yeah. So so going to the Bible is one of the main things. Uh, the next thing I would say is is prayer. And I think this goes with processing our trauma. We need to process that with the Lord. Mm-hmm. So you can talk to me as a counselor about it. You could talk to a family member. You could talk to a pastor. But you need to talk with the Lord through that. And there can be a tendency, depending on where we're at with God, to feel anger or to have a lot of questions. And almost there can be this place where we're tempted to turn away from God into, instead of toward Him. Mm-hmm. But part of that biblical healing in receiving that is turning toward him and talking to him about it. I mean, Job talked to him about the hard stuff. He said some things were like, Woo, yeah. you really want to say that to God? Um, he, he, did, he didn't have he a did. script to his prayer. No. Yeah. Like he, he was real. Yeah. He was real with God because God can handle it. Yes, right. God already knows. Yep. So, so we've got to process that and pray through that. Prayer is just talking to God. Like pray through that and process that with him. And it's great to process it with other people that also know him as a believer yep. and can help with that because it, you know, God made us to be relational beings. We're not yeah. supposed to do this by ourselves. I was um, with a client working through some childhood trauma and we just really, I, I told her, I was like, we need to pray. I was like, we just need to take some time to specifically pray about the impact that this trauma has had. Mm-hmm. And so in the middle of praying through that, like the Holy Spirit was revealing some things to me. Yeah. To pray over her. To uh, there was at one point I was like, "Hey, I really feel like the Holy Spirit is kind of putting this in. Tell me about that. Like, mm-hmm. let's let's. I mean, there's a when you can do that with other believers. I mean, because it says we're two or more together. He's yeah. there, right? His presence is there. That that's healing too. So so prayer, having prayer involved in that with you talking to God about it individually, and then having somebody that you trust that you know is walking with the Lord and and wanting to hear and intercede for you in that way to walk you through that as well, which is yeah. one of the things we do at Narrowgate. That's, yeah, yeah. that's part of biblical counseling yeah. is to do that. Um, and then the you talk about, or you, in, in this question, you were also talking about praise. You know, um, one of the things I love about Isaiah 61, and I'd really like for us to end reading that, yeah. but um, it talks about taking... Um, the garment of despair and putting on the garment of praise, Mm. which is a direct answer to when we're despairing because trauma can make us despair about a lot of things, um, depending on where we go with all of that. And just knowing that the answer to that despair is the garment of praise. Mm -hmm. And so when you are listening to songs that are talking about we are overcomers or that are very scripturally sound in what they are saying. Some of the, I mean, hymns are rich with all of that too. That's one thing. That's one reason I still um, love hymns because they, they're just so solid. In, I mean, you're just singing scripture a lot yeah, of times yeah, with yeah. hymns. Just straight, just straight scripture with a, a little chorus added yeah. to the end of it. Um, but finding those songs in the middle of that praise that really speak to what your soul is needing in mm-hmm. the moment. Like it's the answer to that despair that, 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 that trauma is bringing or has brought to your life. So that, I mean, praise is, so it's the Bible reading, it's the prayer, it's the praise. Um, and again, it's, it's the positive and safe relationships around that. Because if you process your trauma, if you are in an environment that is not safe mm-hmm. in some way, um, or you don't have positive, safe relationships, then that trauma 
can be used advantageously against you. It can be used as the enemy, as warfare instead. I mean, there's just so there's that place of finding, finding a safe place to do that Yeah, is key too. Okay. So recognizing that scripture addresses trauma, mm-hmm. um, recognizing that you take it to the Lord with complete honesty and vulnerability, right? We're not, we're not scripting prayers. We're just laying it out before the Lord. Mm-hmm. And then recognizing the work that praise does to kind of shift our focus. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, you've one day, one day I want you to have an entire conversation with the world. Okay. <laughs> about, about how the brain can be transformed. Whew, yeah. Right. Because, we feel so stuck in our thoughts and stuck mm-hmm. in our thought patterns. And especially with somebody in trauma, like, like I said, that lady could not get around it. Yeah. And she set up almost a makeshift shrine. Absolutely. Right. And so now she's, it's a constant, constant reminder. How do you, how have you seen the word of God and, and praise for that matter, transform somebody's mind, transform their thinking? So, oh, this plays into so much stuff. Let me see how I simplify this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Heavy questions today. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. It's it's amazing. They're just so rich. Like you said, we could spend we could spend so long on each one of these topics. So it's that place of like, how yeah. do you answer that in enough of a fullness of the mm-hmm. question, but not spend five hours? Yep. Um, and a mini seminar on it. So, or a weekend seminar. I mean, yeah, you could really go into all of that. So re- the Bible talks about renewing our mind, renewing our mind. And what that looks like from a neuroscientific standpoint is what we would call rewiring our brain because we have those pathways. And those pathways grow. So let's think of like um, cutting a path through the woods. Those pathways grow um, by our experiences, but they also grow through intention and continuing to walk those paths. So if a path is freshly cut, um, the more that people continue to walk down it, the more that you walk down that path, then that Mm -hmm. road is going to be a path well traveled, right? The weeds are going to stop growing up and I mean, different things like it's going to be a very, it's going to be a very cut, clear path. Mm -hmm. And so... When we are rewiring our brains, we are intentionally cutting new pathways. So events and things can, can quickly cut pathways for us, but in the renewing of Scripture and the way that we are choosing what to focus on, when we focus on certain things, the pathways grow that way because that's the intentionality. Mm-hmm. So... When we are camping out on scripture that is saying that um, God is close to the brokenhearted or God has come in some way to heal me, whatever scripture that would be, maybe that's in a psalm, maybe that's in another place, and we're intentionally shifting to that, we are leading our brain instead of following into a different path. And that's hard at first. But it gets easier and easier and easier to do on top of the fact that as believers, we have the Holy Spirit power within us to do it. God recently reminded me, and I love this so much. So if we talk about the scripture, God did not give me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I, Mm -hmm. I recently went back and I was like, God, what? I I remember the sound mind or self-discipline or self-control, depending on the version that you read. All of those mean the same thing. Mm But I was like, what does power mean? Like, I get love too, agape, right? Unconditional. What does power actually mean? And I went back and looked at it in the Greek, and it says as in like an army. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay. And, and, like, and, and the picture that God gave me in that moment was this place of a, a holy army, like an army of angels or like a heavenly army. Like we have the power because of the Holy Spirit inside of us of a heavenly army. And so 
when it's hard and we're walking through the, because we have to walk through it. There's the fact of what happens to us in trauma. And then there's the impact of what happens to us in trauma. And mo- while God can heal people instantly, and he's done that in the Bible, and he has done that for people and just taken things away, a lot of the times as believers, we have to walk through the impact of a trauma. And when you think about doing that with the power of heavenly armies behind you, I get pumped. Yeah, for real. Like I start feeling that spirit of power of like, I'm not doing this by myself. It's hard work. Yeah. And I'm going through it or the person's going through it. But I got a heavenly army behind me helping yeah. me do that. You, you, do you know that that Greek word dunami for power is where we in Amer- as Americans get the word dynamite? No, I didn't know that. That's where we get the word See, dynamite. Yeah. It even keeps going back. Yeah. Yeah. Dynamite. Um, so what you're saying is, is that the more you invest your mind into the word and maybe less into the trauma, you're creating new mental pathways for your brain to start thinking about what you've walked through. Yeah. And giving you a different frame of reference for yeah. it. Like there's a transforming that happens that only the Holy Spirit can do, that only God can do, that I don't know if it redesigns it, but it gives us answers that maybe we didn't have before. Yeah. Um, There's purpose, I guess. There's meaning. I, I have to be careful when I say this because I know it can be so painful, but suffering produces some good things in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So, yeah. You said Isaiah 61, um, and uh, that you wanted to read Isaiah 61. I don't yes. know if you've got it printed, um, but I've, I've got it here. The, the, the Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead Mm -hmm. of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify Him. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the former devastations. (laughs) They will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers will stand and feed your flocks, and foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you will be called the Lord's priest. Mm. They will speak of you as ministers of our God, and you will eat the wealth of the nations, and you will boast in their riches. In the place of your shame, you will have a double portion. In the place of disgrace, they will rejoice yes. over their share. So they will possess double in their land, and eternal joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and injustice. I will faithfully reward my people and make a permanent covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their posterity among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. I will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation, wrapped me in robes of, in a robe of righteousness. As a groom wears a turban, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth produces its growth, and as a garden enables what is sown to spring up, so the Lord, God, will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And yeah. I mean, that's, we could stop there. I mean, and the reason I love that is because those, I mean, it's talking about Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. He's the one that's coming in those first few verses. It's talking about what he's going to do. And he chose to keep, he he chose to keep the scars. Stop it. Do you, um, do you, do you, I mean, like he, he had that choice. He chose to keep the scars in his hands. He chose to keep the wound in his side because he knows our suffering. All right. We've got to go to a break before we close this show. And we're going to have a praise break while <laughs> yeah. you're on commercial. So uh, you're listening to the Merch Podcast. We'll be right back in just a minute.
Welcome back to the Merch Podcast, and uh, we are going to have a quick exit today, and I just want you to know, um, we, we wanted to give you the tools. If you're going through trauma, or you know somebody going through trauma, we wanted to give you the tools to help them. And so one way that you can help them, and I, this sounds so vain, but is to share this podcast, is to take the time and share with your friends, your family members, this podcast. Um, we want you to, to use it freely and abundantly, uh, point them to this episode, and, uh, and, just, and just give them the tools they need, the biblical tools, to have some freedom from the burdens they carry. What we also want to do is we want to send them to Narragate Counseling. Uh, Lindy uh, and her staff are phenomenal, and uh, they have a lot of tools to help uh, you or your loved one, your friend, uh, to walk through this with them. Um, Lindy, how can we find Narragate Counseling? Um, You can find us on the web at narragatecounseling.com. You can also call us at 888-962-7769. Um, you can also request, um, once you go to the website, you can even request appointment online that way. So, All right. Can yeah. I ask a, a detailed question? Lord? Sure. Do y'all take insurance? Absolutely. Okay. So they take the insurance. Folks. It's all on the website, the ones that we take. So it'll be at the bottom. If you scroll through, it says at the bottom of the website, the ones that we take. Do y'all work with people who don't have maybe Absolutely. insurance? Absolutely. All the time. Matching. Okay. Every Great. Day. So you heard it there. So if you don't have insurance, don't maybe have their <laughs> insurance. Call Narragate Counseling. They're going to work with you. We want you to walk in the freedom of Jesus through the trauma that you've experienced. Lindy, I, I've just like I told you in a break, I'm going to steal some sermon notes from you, <laughs> and I just want to thank you for being here and doing this with us. Absolutely. Coming thank you once so much. again and uh, helping us to, as believers to flesh this out. Thank you for your continued work to lead other people to walk in the victory of Jesus through heavy, heavy stuff. Uh, thank you to 105.7 Temple Baptist Church, Dan DeBruler, and my amazing family and good friend, J.D. Green. And remember, God is using you. He made you, saved you, and redeemed you for His good works. Ask the Lord to show you the good work that He has prepared ahead of time for your good and His glory, and then follow through with great confidence that the Holy Spirit will lead you and use you to make the most of Jesus Christ. Until next time, you're listening to The Merge Podcast. God bless. You've been listening to The Merge with host Chris Autry. You can find out more and share with your friends. Just look for The Merge anywhere you listen to podcasts.